I'm going to go to... Uh, yeah. So, so, so here you have a, a, a picture of Jim. I've, I found somebody had our 1976 yearbook from New Mexico Tech. And uh, Jim was the, the president, the pres right there. Boston is his nickname. And uh, let's see if we can zoom in. Classic uh, hats. So there, there you have it, a blast from the past. Um, I, I was in there too. Uh oh, see if I can find that. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, there's, there's me. Um, back in my curly days. I actually looked a lot more like that just a few days ago. Until yeah, I noticed. Sam <laughs> gave me a, a haircut, a proper haircut. Okay. Totally so, yeah, so we're a uh, speaker, uh, is uh, an alumnus of New Mexico Tech, and uh, has uh, come to be state paleontologist of Utah, uh, works at the Utah Geological Survey, uh, and he's uh, like the, the fossil raw, raw guy for Utah. What a wonderful job. And uh, he's done uh, lots of splendid work on... Uh, Utah Raptor and other dromaeosaurs. So, um, where'd you where'd you get your degree, Jim? I did my master's at Northern Arizona. So once I graduated, a week later I was in Flagstaff, and then did my PhD at the University of Colorado. Uh, All right. Then did a few years teaching at the University of Nebraska. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I'll I'll watch the. Uh, um, the waiting room, and uh, you uh, go ahead and try to share the screen. Let's and see. if anybody has uh, problems, let me know. And we've got that uh, chat feature; you can type little messages in. All right. Oh, here's Eddie. There's the neutron generator. All right. And from the beginning. Okay. I know I'm screen sharing. So, yeah, it's working great. So, there we go. All right. So now you don't have to look at me anymore. <laughs> well, it's nice to be here, talk to you about uh, the dinosaur that got me my job. Uh, there's no question about it uh, because I named Utah Raptor and landed me the position the state paleontologist of Utah. And uh, through Dave, I actually met my predecessor, the first state paleontologist, I'm the third, uh, Jim Madsen, uh, which you know, he used to help them out up in the San Juan Basin, identifying some of their discoveries, his dad and Dave. And, uh, they took me up there a few times, and <laughs> that's where I first cut my teeth on digging dinosaurs. Um, who would know that you know, 35, actually 45 years after that first trip, I'm still doing it and still finding new dinosaurs. Okay, let's see if we can. Yep. This roller is I wish it would be easier. I need a better one. Anyway, the way I'm going to go through this is I'm going to look at the history of discovery of the dromaeosaurs, or raptors as the public knows them. Uh, the dromaeosaurs, uh, you know, were first discovered in the first one in 1922, Dromaeosaurus. And if you look at the way I'll lay a lot of these things out, you'll see I have a number there, number one. So that means this was the number one animal described in this family of dinosaurs. And generally I'll have the Susan Brown, there's Barnum Brown, William Diller Matthew right there, where it's from, uh, try to give a good clue on that, and some of the fossils. And then as we go, we'll discuss what we learned from each of these discoveries because it just really builds up uh, over time. And we learn more and more with each additional discovery that's really shaped our view on what these animals were really like and what their relationships were. So this is Dromaeosaurus. It's the lower part of the skull, some foot bones, and that's pretty much it. And it's never been a second one found, uh, though we find the teeth. Uh, so we know they're out there at different sites of that age, but there's no uh, set found identified as Dromaeosaurus albertensis. 
it's almost a hundred years. That's kind of interesting. Uh, but in the same time interval that that was described, the Mongolian expeditions of the American Museum of Natural History were going on through the 20s, led by Roy Chapman Andrews and Walter Granger sitting there by that dinosaur nest. Just a nice little over after nest. Protoceratops at the time. Spent a little time in that area. And I'll tell you, it's, uh, there's a lot of fossils. <laughs> uh, but Velociraptor mongoliensis was described in 1924 by Henry Fairfield Osborne. Uh, it's a smallish animal on the order of about, you know, long direction there, the tip of the tail, about six foot long. You can see in this skeleton, some of the real classic features that we see in dromaeosaurs. Uh, you see the pulled back pubis, this bone that hangs down, you know, it's, this is the ilium, the bone of the pelvis. Then there's the two hanging down bones. Pubis is in the front, it usually inclines forward in most theropods, but in these animals, it's pulled back in the more bird-like position. And the ischium starts becoming uh, much shortened uh, and more complicated than your typical ischium, uh, the back of those two hanging down bones. But this is a classic pelvis that we see in a dromaeosaur. Also, the tail, about eight or so vertebra out from the hips, transitions so that the zygopophyses or the articular surface in the vertebra extend and wrap around each other, as do the hemal arches. These are the hanging down things under the tail, and they become elongate and twist around each other to make the distal tail uh, really stiff and solid on the velociraptorines. Uh, so this animal, you know, could use that to help balance because on his feet it had these large claws uh, that used to be thought of as slashing, but if you start looking at them and think of the kind of prey items they might've been going for, you probably can't drag a claw easily through inch thick skin or half inch even, uh, you know, the rawhide that a larger dinosaur might have. So I tend to think they might've been stabbing with those things. And other people have now speculated that they actually, these smaller ones were actually just holding prey down with those claws but they're especially adapted to uh, hold that claw above the ground when they walk to keep it sharp. So it, it was using it uh, where a pointed end was uh, important enough that evolutionary selection, you know, characterized that thing, keep it nice and sharp, out of the way and ready for use. They also have large arms. You know, you think of T-Rex with his short puny little arms. And of course, a nice skull full of sharp serrated teeth. There's a nice skull of one of those. Okay. Now, real important find uh, was made by during the Polish Mongolian expeditions in the 60s, led by Zofia Kilojorska. Uh, and Zofia, you know, in the 60s, leading, you know, and really started like 61, these expeditions from Poland into Mongolia. Uh, there weren't that many women leading, and there was a team of about 30 people. I mean, it was a big expedition year after year. And she ran the thing like a clock. Halkals Molska, who I've met several times, including I met her in Mongolia one time, uh, been really helpful with my work on Velociraptorines, but she's been in charge of describing the theropods from that expedition. And fortunately, they both passed away just a few years ago. Uh, but here's a reconstruction of what it might have been like with these two animals intertwined, a protoceratops and a velociraptorine. These are how they were buried in the rock. You still, there's still some of the original rock holding the thing together. Uh, these things were probably, if you've ever seen a lizard or something fighting with another lizard in the desert, they're pretty rowdy when they're doing that. And these things were rolling around, uh, you know, they're both six foot, eight foot long animals, rolling around, smashing, screaming at each other. And they caused the sand dune to collapse, burying them in this incredible uh, uh, tableau of, of a true battle for the ages. Now, as I said, I've gotten to work in Mongolia. I've gotten to work in China. I've been very fortunate uh, that I've gotten to work in a lot of places that have rounded out my education on these things. And when I first got to the Flaming Cliffs, 
uh, within three hours, I had found a velociraptor skeleton. I'm holding a claw, float claw from it. And I excavated it in about two hours. This stuff is digging beach sand practically. Very good to do. Uh, and then, uh, well, this happened a bit later, but I found uh, protos that I think are in uh, burrows. And they're always associated with pupae and borings uh, by scavenger beetles into the bone. So there seems to have been a real relationship with animals buried in the sand dunes and beetles flying over, sniffing out these rotting carcasses, landing and digging down to lay their eggs in the carcass. Uh, this thing probably had four or 500 inch long pupae associated with it. And, you know, nestled in the jaw area and then ankles and things. But the ankles, the cartilage in the ankle areas always gets chewed away by these things. You know, they're eating the meat and then they start going to the more chewy uh, cartilaginous material at the end. And on my birthday, here I am uh, starting into a fairly severe appendic uh, appendix attack. Uh, they wanted to airlift me out of there. I refused to go. I didn't know it was appendicitis. Because if it had gone, I would have been dead. Uh, but here I am with a Panacosaurus skull. This was my birthday. I love ankylosaurs. And I found three of them that day. So it was a nice birthday present, but they had to drive me back to camp because I couldn't even walk within a few hours of this picture being taken. Uh, Dromaeosaurus was re-described by Edwin H. Colbert and Dale Russell in 1969. Uh, Colbert was actually W.D. Matthews' son-in-law and Dale Russell was his student. So the American Museum people, a lot of nepotists <laughs> moving down, but Dale went up and became the head paleontologist of the National Museum of Canada. And uh, both of these guys were, were, over the years, great mentors. That they named a dinosaur, Ned Colbertia, uh, for uh, Ned, because he's he was my hero. That's why I went to Flagstaff, because he was at the Museum of Northern Arizona, retired. But they erected the family Dromaeosaur Day to include Dromaeosaurus and Velociraptor. And you look at the date, you know, this is like 50 something years later between the naming of Dromaeosaurus uh, and this. And then they name one more animal in this thing, uh, which was described the same year, kind of parallel papers by one of Ned's uh, other students, John Ostrom at Yale. And John discovered Deinonychus anthropus, the terrible claw. And this was one of the big finds. This is really what broke open uh, the work that dinosaurs weren't just sluggish end members uh, uh, deserving of no special attention whatsoever. And this is only the third animal described in 1969. Uh, now, Bob Barker, who maybe you've heard of, one of the more famous dinosaur guys in the world, uh, his uh, Dinosaur Heresies book uh, is uh, proclaimed as being one of the big things that got the dinosaur renaissance going. And certainly Bob uh, headlined that renaissance pretty much like it was all his. But this picture of Deinonychus uh, sprinting along, that was his first published figure. And it was done in the front piece of the book describing uh, Deinonychus. This is a tale showing how the stiffened extensions of bone, these aren't tendons, these are extensions of the bone, wrap around uh, like spaghetti around the vertebral column on the tail. So when you break the tail like it is here, it's like breaking a bunch of spaghetti. It was stiff and probably didn't break easily. Uh, but this is a new velociraptorine that occurs with Utah raptor. It's almost invisible. <laughs> UV works pretty good sometimes in uh, visualizing these animals. Now, one of the things that uh, John noted is they had very distinctive teeth, the dromaeosaurs. The serration size from front to back were very different. The front, they were very small serrations. In fact, on some of these animals, they don't even, ex they don't have any serrations, but they're generally much smaller. Uh, and in the posterior part, they're much larger, angled forward, forming a nice cutting edge. And this is a real characteristic of the Deinonychosaurs in general is this two different size serrations on the teeth. Now, John was the first one to really point out that Deinonychus was related to birds. 
and he got to study Arche Archaeopteryx. In fact, they got the specimen, the best specimen from Germany to Berlin, Archaeopteryx at Yale. I've got a first generation cast of it on my wall in my living room, which is pretty nice. Uh, and he noted that bone for bone, joint to joint, these things were really similar. Uh, see, Archaeopteryx, so the tail's not quite as stiffened, but uh, this picture shows it with a sickle claw. I'm not so sure how, how sickle-like it is, but they got long, big arms, long, big hands. Uh, but the dinosaur-bird relationship was first championed by Thomas Henry Huxley, but soon after he proclaimed that this is the relationship, it was totally poo-pooed. Dinosaurs were big, sluggish, dead end. They couldn't have anything to do with something as wonderful as birds. And until uh, John brought the whole story back around in 69, uh, that thing for years uh, was discounted. And they used to have crocodile relatives as the most likely relative, close relatives of birds. Oops. Uh, so there's my Archaeopteryx specimen, all hand colored by my preparator for me. Uh, but it was described, of course, 1861 yeah, with Dinonychus. And, you know, look at that pelvis, look at that pelvis. Real similar. There's a lot in common. And he speculated that maybe these guys are even feathered. And Greg Paul. A paleo artist, paleontologist from John Hopkins uh, provided the first figure of a feathered uh, raptor. And there it is, kind of a strange thing, more like hair on it and a little top knot and some feathers. But that was the first feathered dinosaur given the new information. Now, something that John had noticed and his students is that there were sites that had multiple Dinonica skeletons. Yeah. I, I like Under plant that. eater called Tyrannosaurus, and he, here's a Tyrannosaurus. It's typically thought of as a uh, bipedal plant eater, uh, but it often we walk in quadrupedally. As and you can see, this enamel got to 25 foot long or so. Dinonychus probably body length about eight feet. Think of it as a sized animal, pretty good size. Uh, but, uh, you know, bigger than Velociraptor. Uh, and what they really thought was going on is these guys were probably pack hunters because here's a site, uh, Montana, there's a tail of a Tyrannosaurus. There's a tail of three different uh, Dinonychus. Here's a site in Oklahoma. There's remains of a couple different Dinonychus and there's part of a Tyrannosaurus. Uh, and there's been records in Yellowstone of wolf packs attacking good, half healthy uh, uh, bull bison and having eight bulls gut and lunch. Not a good thing to keep up because you're not going to survive very long <laughs> if eight of you die every time you go for lunch. But, uh, you know, this is recorded. You know, being a predator is a hard life. Uh, we've got a site, this is right on the edge of Capitol Reef that we excavated in 2012 of a Tyrannosaurus. This is late Albion in age. It's oh, around uh, 104 million. So it's a little bit younger than the classic Dinonychus uh, skeletons and the Iguanodon, probably a new species, but it's close to Tyrannosaurus. And there's a sole, lone skeleton. Let's see, it's up on one of these points here. Uh, all by itself, there weren't a lot of skeletons out there, but in the site, we found. Uh, Anika's tooth with the characteristic uh, serrations, right size. And we found some coprolites in with the skeleton, uh, about the size of coyote coprolites, you know, uh, turds. Uh, so we're gonna get this, these CT scanned. And our hope is, since feathers are almost undigestible, these things are, would be preening their, we think they're feathered, that we should see bits of feather in the coprolite. So a micro CT scanner, which will go down to cell size and smaller, uh, should be able to uh, pick out the feather bits if they're there. So we're really looking forward to seeing what that'll uh, show us. And I'll bring someone on who's more attuned to uh, looking at feathers than myself. I always like to work with people that are smarter than me. It makes me look good. 
Uh, okay, number four, 1978, Hans Dieter Seuss. And he would have been a grad student because I remember running into Hans at Harvard one time in the uh, late 80s uh, uh, and certainly in the early 80s when he was a grad student at Harvard. So this thing, he would have been a grad student when he named this. But all he had was the skull roof. And by looking at the skull roof, he was able to diagnose that with the size of the brain and other features that are present in it, uh, that this thing was a, you know, dromaeosaur. Nothing else. That's all he had was a skull roof. But as it turns out, even though this thing found in the same beds as dromaeosaur, it's way more common. Uh, so bits of the skull, here's a foot here, uh, come are found fairly commonly. Uh, and this thing was found a few years ago. The skull has recently been described in some detail. Uh, this is a Sornithalestes Langston eye mummy, and it's beautifully preserved. Uh, the tail's clipped off here, cut off at the end. I think that's what was sticking out, but everything's there. The skin preserved, and these are the teeth from the front of the jaw, and look at those ridges on it. Those are actually thought to be a different genus of dinosaur called Paranicodon. And it turns out the Truodons, the Dromaeosaur, Dromaeosaurus, and uh, uh, Velociraptorines all have these kind of teeth. Just in the bone. that's the bone that goes from here to there. And generally has three to four teeth in most theropod dinosaurs, has those ridges. Uh, real telltale mark of these things. Uh, Riken Bars Bowl. Well, I got to spend some time with in Mongolia, described this somewhat scrappy skeleton of a, a dromaeosaur. It may, it may actually be a dromaeosaurine from the Gobi. There's just not a lot of it to be sure. That's the back of the head. It's always nice to have. Here's the pelvis. Here's a foot and the sickle claw's pointed towards you. So you can't really see, but it's not a huge sickle claw in this thing. Uh, Phil Curry uh, at the Royal Tyrell Museum did a paper with Bob Sloan in Minnesota and, uh, and uh, oh, oh, from BYU, uh, Keith Rigby. He was at Notre Dame after that. But anyway, did the three of them did a paper looking at all the dinosaur teeth in the dinosaur park formation. You know, they have beautiful jaws and things with teeth in them because they, they have all these microsites. So like, can we identify the teeth? And the thing they found is they could identify every single known tax of, of meat-eating dinosaur in the dinosaur park formation by the morphology of the teeth. And they noticed that dromaeosaurs had teeth with real box-like big denticles, as you see here, where the velociraptorines are kind of twisted upward. These things also, the premaxillary teeth had a twist, I'm trying to indicate here, toward the tip of the premaxillary teeth that you never saw in the velociraptorines. So they actually used the teeth to split those two groups uh, initially. And, uh, and, you know, it's held up, but it was just the teeth they used to make that initial split. 1989, uh, going down to Flagstaff to do some field work with my good buddy Jeff Eaton. Uh, we, Suze and I stopped with my baby daughter in Moab to uh, basically have lunch as we headed out. And I finished up and zipped next door to the rock shop. And in the window of the rock shop, I saw this thing down here. And this is the pelvis of an armored dinosaur with a shield of fused bone like a turtle over the back of it. And the only thing at that time that was known to be like that was Polacanthus uh, from England. So I had just found a Jurassic ankylosaur, this one here, my Morifelta, uh, and got pretty excited. And this guy here, Rob Gaston, was behind the counter of the rock shop and uh, took me out to the site. And uh, lo and behold, uh, even though they thought it was Morrison, I realized pretty quickly it was actually early Cretaceous. And this is how we found Aston Quarry, uh, and I named the armored dinosaur Gastonia burgi. You'll see pictures of it uh, in a bit. Here's the quarry. It was interbedded in limestone and siltstones, probably repeated flood deposits on the margin of a lake. 
there's some dinosaur tracks on these horizons. Uh, the bones tend to be flattened like a steamroller went over them. And in fact, they're bent down over tracks. Uh, there's a little front of a jaw of a little meat-eating dinosaur. You see here, premaxillary teeth. There's a tibia, a lower leg bone. And here's a claw, twice as big as any big sickle claws that have ever been found at this time. And I got real excited about it. And this, on this dig, uh, Don Burge from the museum, uh, museum in Price, Utah, they're going, oh, the pictures, John Ostrom had sent me some of his publications because I was working on the armored dinosaurs of approximately the same age as his Cloverleaf stuff uh, that had Deinonychus in it. I said, ah, that's just a big Deinonychus too. It was probably wrong. You know, it's not, this is, you know, interesting, but not super exciting. Well, that not be the case. There's Gastonia, a little one and a big one. We got at least a dozen of these animals now. That's one of the most common animals in this level. This is what we call the yellow cat member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. And it's the upper yellow cat. You discover there's two faunas, a lower yellow cat fauna and an upper yellow cat fauna. And then a poison strip fauna. These are the, you know, and then there's a ruby ranch fauna, which there's two, an even higher one if you go west. Here's the quarry map. The red things are Utah raptor bones. The rest of them are different parts of Gastonia. Uh, pretty excited. Went to the SVP meeting, in San Diego. Showed this to John Ostrom without breaking, you know, pausing a second. He was actually with Jim Madsen when <laughs> I showed this to him. And he said, you know how big that would be? That'd be like a foot long, and he'd, this thing would cut you to shreds. He just went for it. Uh, so I was pretty happy. Bob Bacher told me it was a piece of junk. Uh, <laughs> uh, holding court uh, by the door. But uh, John, I went with John's thoughts. Anyway, here's the first mount, first generation mount of Utah Raptor, Ostrom Mays Orum. Orum is the plural name. There's two men, Chris Mays and John Ostrom. Uh, but I've been told we initially named it with an eye. We're dropping the oar and putting back the eye. I haven't changed it back again. But it's pretty neat work on that site. Luis Ahoyas that did this great book uh, through National Geographic, Hunting Dinosaurs, was traveling around shooting for this National Geographic issue on dinosaurs back in the early 90s. This would have been 91, uh, yeah, 92, probably 91, maybe 92. Anyway, he stopped in and he brought his buddy with him from Philadelphia, Edward Drinker Cope of the Marsh Cope Dinosaur Feud. And Cope's skull and skeleton and uh, maybe some other parts are curated at the Philadelphia Academy of uh, Sciences. And his thought was he would be the holotype of Homo sapiens. Uh, but the Baron George, George Cuvier in France had the same idea too. So no one's really picked who is the holotype specimen of our species. But I got to have Cope visit my site uh, that made my career. So I can't complain too much, you know, working with giants. Here are all the bones from that site of Utah Raptor. That's it. You hold them in two hands, kind of big, but you can balance them. Both tibias, uh, some ribs, vertebra, tail vertebra, uh, some dorsals. You know, the claws, both sickle claws, foot walking claws, some parts of the skull, both premaxillas, the ankle bone. Uh, so we had, we had a pretty good collection of stuff, pretty, some pretty critical things for describing and naming this animal. But at the time we didn't know it was a bone bed that uh, there was more, you know, you know, we now know there's only one Utah Raptor there. At the time there could have been more. So you gotta pick a type specimen, an individual bone, so we picked the claw. We got a paper now just getting ready to submit, re-describing all of this stuff in light of modern knowledge, uh, where everything now goes to Utah Raptor. Here's the site. The quarry is right there. I'm gonna climb down through this cliff and then hike along here to get to the site. Very stiff when we first found it. You really did have to put uh, uh, you know Velcro on your butt to, to hang on there. But as we work, we made a broader and broader bench. Uh, here is the formations that we recognize. Morrison Formation, the Upper Jurassic. The Cedar Mountain Formation extends 
through the yellow cap member, poison strip member, and ruby ranch member here. It is overlain by the Natarita formation, uh, formerly improperly known as Dakota formation. Um, the Cedar Mountain, this is the second fauna, it's from the upper Cedar Mountain, and it's characterized by Gastonia burgi. There's Gastonia, that's the first skull, the holotype skull. There's the first mount again of Utah Raptor, and a couple of Utah Raptors trying to figure out how to open up a Gastonia. This is probably like the most armored dinosaur that ever existed, uh, and it makes sense since it's the most common thing with Utah Raptor. Uh, across the other side of Arches National Park, same fold of the rocks, uh, there was a site that was first opened up in the 70s by Brigham Young University. Uh, they were mainly looking at the iguanodonts and sauropods, a lot of sauropod skeletons, big long neck dinosaurs. But at this point, they've got at least parts of eight different individuals of Utah Raptor from this site. Here's that poison strip sandstone up here, and it's not this bed here. It's way up there. And it's about the same level as that other site. You know, so we're pretty comfortable. Same kind of animals occur here. The old dates were 124 million that BYU published based on detrital uh, zircons, uranium lead dates. Basically the, you know, the oldest zircon you see, the youngest zircon you see had to pre-exist. You know, you can't bring them from the future back into the rocks, but it had to exist already. So that becomes your uh, uh, minimum date on this. Uh, you know, 124 they came up with. We have a bunch of new data, uh, 10 or 12 times as many, zir over 3,000 zircons dated now individually. And the dates are around 135, 136 million. Uh, and it's tied really well to pollen, ostracods, caraphytes. Um, it's pretty solid. You know, it's pre-angiosperms. There are no flowering plants in this part of the Cretaceous. Uh, when, here's some of the animals that lived at uh, uh, the Dalton Well site. This is an animal we named a while back, Hippodraco Ottengeri, after Lynn Ottinger, or our rock shop. Ottengeri was named actually by Jim Jensen at BYU as Iguanodon Ottengeri. We named Hippodraco, and now I'm pretty sure they're the same thing. So Hippo, Draco, Hot and Dry, of course, Utah Raptor. There's Velociraptor, show you what's really going on. Chris Pratt for scale. It's Gastonia Burgi skeleton there. He's my baby, it's my favorite dinosaur. Uh, we have an Ornithomimid I named Ned Colbertia, uh, which there's a pretty complete skeleton that Rob is working on mounting uh, right now. There are dinosaur tracks associated with some of those sandstone beds right there at the quarry. Uh, Hippodraco gets a lot bigger than the type specimen, and here's part of his tail, but it had real short uh, neural spines, the, the bones that stick up above the vertebra near the base of the tail. Here's another animal there that's got a low sail or ridge down its back, so it's a new iguanodon, and the vertebra are quite different, quite long spines on it. And they've got at least 18 Moabasaurus is there. This is Moabasaurus utahensis, and it's a Toriosaur. And when I described the underlying Mirasaurus, that's when we realized this thing was a Toriosaur. These things had only been found in Europe until we found uh, you know, our specimens. And apparently at the end of the Jurassic, all our local Jurassic dinosaurs went extinct, sauropods. You know, like eight different kinds. They all went extinct and are replaced by European lineages. Cedarosaurus, it's a brachiosaurid, but it's more closely related, of course, to a European brachiosaur than brachiosaurus itself. Uh, there are the gizzard stones there that are found with this skeleton. And that's a, uh, but they don't have a neck and head on that animal. That's one of the sternal plates from the chest area. Well, Jurassic Park was in its formative stages. You know, I named Utah Raptor in 1993 when the movie came out. That's when officially was named, but I discovered it in 1990 when the book came out. And uh, there's a lot of attention received for that. I always like to say the accuracy in the movie uh, decreases with distance from Michael Crichton. Uh, so the recent stuff is 
far less <laughs> scientifically rigorous than the first movie. It goes downhill all the way from there. Spielberg and his gang could care less. Uh, why do they call the big animal in the movie Velociraptor? It was based on Deinonychus in his book. It, I mean, he's talking to people I know, you know, and, you know, he was using Deinonychus. All who did that first feathered dinosaur picture decided they were the same thing, even though Velociraptor is late Cretaceous, around 85 million or 80 million in Asia. And Deinonychus is early Cretaceous, around 110 million in the USA, and is a much smaller animal. And uh, Deinonychus does not have quite as elongated a skull. So Greg, uh, you know, combined them in the same thing. He's a big lumper, uh, but that, that's ridiculous. You know, species don't do that. Uh, and I think he used the name because Velociraptor is easier to say for the public than Deinonychus. You know, it was an artistic piece of work. But in 92, we announced that we had this animal. Uh, the movie was in uh, final stages of production, editing, whatnot. And uh, Time Magazine put it the seventh big best science story of 92. Discover Magazine put it on the cover. Got lots of good press. But we announced it back in like September, August. And we announced it, the, the press release came out the day of Desert Storm. So it didn't go anywhere <laughs> in terms of PR. So if you're gonna start a war, don't come out with a press release on the same day. You're not gonna win. <laughs> but Utah Raptor got a lot of people excited. They're games, card games, you know, toys, uh, you know, books came out. There's multiple books about it. Uh, this is one of the best ones by Lessum, illustrated by Donna Bragan. It's I always like this cover. It's like, yeah, that's pretty much what we know. <laughs> about this animal, the hands and feet. And Bacher went out and wrote Raptor Red about a Utah Raptor family. Uh, he got $800,000 advance for this novel. The biggest advance for first novel in the history of Bantam books. And you would think Bob would support the project, but not a penny. Uh, but we won't talk about that. Spielberg didn't support it either. And they made a lot of money off their uh, Utah Raptor toys for the first movie. There's Utah Raptor electronic roaring sound. And then another one that came out for Lost World, another Utah Raptor. Uh, you know, nothing. We got nothing. Uh, Dynamation, I used to work for them building robotic dinosaurs, nonprofit uh, participant funded research uh, branch. Uh, they did a Utah Raptor very quickly. In fact, they tried. They wanted to copyright Utah Raptor as a name, uh, but they did. They couldn't do that. Uh, but they did copyright Super Slasher, which no one has ever used. That's a good way to kill something is copyright it. Anyway, there's Dave Thomas Sr. with his sculpture of Utah Raptor, done for the Vernal Fieldhouse pre feathered dinosaurs. But you note its hands are facing inward and not downward. Very good, Dave. You're on top of things. You know, no one at this point had knew they had feathers. John was suspicious though. And there's John with Dave. They're good friends for many years. And of course, Utah Raptor is a star of the Kentucky Cretation Museum, Cretation, Creation Museum, sorry. Uh, in Kentucky, they have a life reconstruction of one and then they've got this dig it pit set up. And I wish we had found something as complete as that. Here's the second generation mount at the Prehistoric Museum in Price. It's a better mount than the first one. First one, they actually had hadrosaur parts in there as well. It was done by a lawyer. Uh, the pelvis here is pretty much completely a sculpture. Uh, a lot of it's a sculpture. It's, uh, it's always worth keeping in mind. But we got naked raptors. That's, that's kind of the way we looked at things in the early 90s. Uh, Utah raptor. Uh, as we put a sheath on that sickle claw, that's how we reconstruct the Utah Raptor's sickle claw, that big uplifted blade a foot long, as John said. He was totally right. Uh, and that's a conservative. The end of the bone would be like right there. Birds are often 50% longer than the bone, but we figured let's keep it conservative because people don't like scientists getting out on the edge of the branch. And then here's the one from the movie. Uh, 
And you can see, to me, it always reminds me more of a ram's horn than a functional claw. And the curvature is, you know, it's not even a mathematical curve. You know, it wouldn't be very functional. But uh, so my raptor is better than Spielberg's raptor. That's just the way it is. Uh, this is what learning about the Cedar Mountain formation. So we go across the state, state. There's six faunas in it, spans 45 million years. The big raptors are found in the lower three faunas with polycanthing and achylosaurs, uh, turiosaurs, big tooth brachiosaurs, and then there's a mass extinction. And we get the cloverly type fauna uh, with Tenonosaurus and Deinonychus and uh, slender tooth brachiosaurs. And then they slowly vanish out and the mustn't touch it. And we see the first Asian immigration uh, induced extinction and we get the taxa that'll get bigger and characterize the rest of the Cretaceous. The whole record was not known. When I started work, two known dinosaurs in the Cedar Mountain Formation, and we're now up over 50. Uh, but that extinction is nice because I identified a, at least a Northern Hemisphere wide mass extinction that we had missed, probably tied to flood basalts in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and there's, there's some real nice things. OAE, uh, what is it, 1B uh, uh, is probably what, you know, the anoxic event tied to it as well. But that was probably a big cooling event at that time. Uh, okay, other giant raptors, mega raptor. Soon after Utah raptors, a few years, 98, you know, so five years later, they announced mega raptor from Argentina, twice as big as Utah raptor. But uh, about 15 years ago, they discovered uh, better specimens. And it turns out that giant claw is on the hand. It's the thumb claw. Uh, so it has nothing to do uh, with Utah raptor or dromaeosaurs in general. It's closer to allosaurs. Uh, Kilibatar giganticus from Mongolia. It's not quite as big as Utah raptor, but plenty big. This is the bones they have for it, not a lot. Pelvis is way more primitive than you would expect uh, uh, for an animal that's in the dromaeosaurs. None of them, uh, you know, if you look at these pelvae, uh, have a pelvis like that. That's like tyrannosaur pelvis. They really broaden the base up, uh, like you see here. And Utah raptor does that just as well as the rest of them. So I'm not even sure it's a dromaeosaur, but other people don't agree with me. So I'll keep it with a question mark. Meanwhile, uh, Ferdinand Novas described this animal, Unenlingvia, uh, from these bones here. And looking at the shoulder girdle, he decided that was way bird-like. And he made this something closer to birds than dromaeosaurs. Because he didn't have the feet, didn't have a lot of critical parts. There's that weird little ischium you see on these drive guys. Uh, there's a foot of another animal, Nenquinaraptor, because this thing basically at the time, you know, he didn't think it was a raptor, he thought it was really more bird-like and should be in with the birds. And Nenquinaraptor, uh, Argentinus, in 2005, he described as the first dromaeosaur from Argentina, from South America. And see, that's number 16, and that was number seven, not soon after uh, Utah Raptor was named. Uh, but then my buddy Pete Makovicki there described Butria raptor uh, from Argentina. This is a small animal. You can see how small it is. Long, slender skull, big arms, kind of puny body. Uh, ischium there. Uh, the tail, though, isn't as stiffened as other velociraptorines. And then Ferdinand Novas and some other authors discovered this thing, uh, Ostroraptor. And this thing's a big animal. It's nearly as big as Utah Raptor. But look at those tiny puny arms, unlike any other dromaeosaur. But it's got the sickle claw. It's got a fair bit of the skeleton. But look at those tiny teeth, that long, slender uh, skull. Uh, really distinctive. 21. Uh, Pomperaptor, another one that's really small uh, from Argentina. Argentina's got great fossils. Number 24. Here's the record of the South American stuff. 
through the whole upper Cretaceous. They really don't have any early Cretaceous ones, but they're all the thunder skulls. They seem to be all related into this group, the Unalinginae. So it's another subfamily. So you got Dromaeosaurinae, Velociraptorinae, and Unalinginae uh, as the three groups at this point. Uh, meanwhile, Kathy Forrester and uh, uh, David Krauss, at the time at Stony Brook, uh, were leading expeditions into Madagascar, and they excavated this baby that Kathy got to describe. And this is a little animal. You can see the scale. And here's the foot of it, sickle claw. Beautiful thing. I've gotten to see this specimen. The bone is so pretty. It looks greasy. I mean, it looks like, it, you know, you just lick the meat off at some chicken bones and throw them down. It's a wonderful thing. And they thought that was more of a bird than a dromaeosaur. And they noticed quill knobs on the lower arm bone, the ulna. And this is a bird characteristic. Uh, so they described it as a very primitive bird when at the time they found it. And it's later been you know, found to be an unlinged uh, dromaeosaur. So all the Southern hemisphere Animals like this are all in the same subfamily. Uh, this is showing once again those quill knobs. They discovered them on Velociraptor, and here shows them on a bird. There's a crane, ulna, and you can see they're really distinctive on a bird. They anchor the flight feathers, the primary flight feathers. So here is an independent line of evidence for feathers, and they head this before they found the first fossil feathers but they thought it was a bird. <laughs> the Velociraptor came a bit later when they identified him on those bones. Uh, back in 1996, I actually was given the, 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 uh, I was the moderator of the dinosaur session of SVP at the American Museum. I was out in the hall talking to John Ostrom. Uh, I always liked John quite a bit. And Phil Curry came up with Dr. G uh, from uh, China, and they brought a portfolio that they opened up, and there were pictures of this animal in it. And this is the first feathered dinosaur to come out of China. And I was standing right near John, right when he first got to see this, and I saw the tears in his eyes when he first realized they had found a feathered dinosaur. They weren't the most exciting feathers in the world, this buzz, and this is a pretty basal manner, uh, uh, Solorosaurian, so it wouldn't have flight feathers like you see. convincing feather, uh, feather like fibers on this animal. And they're probably a ring going down the tail, like a ring tailed cat. And I got this is when I had breakfast at Farmer Lee's house in uh, 90, I would say that would have been 1998. Uh, and I actually got to go on the second expedition in there of people from the Bill and John Ostrom and uh, 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 Larry Martin got to do the first trip, but uh, it was pretty exciting. His wife cooked us a great breakfast and uh, took us out to the sites. And we're driving 20 miles of gravel wash bottoms to get there. Now there's a highway right to the site. Uh, China's an amazing place. I've done 20 trips there over the years. It just changes every year year to the next. Uh, the feathered dinosaurs, there are bunches of them. I've actually been in a room with several hundred feathered dinosaurs on exhibit of different species, uh, including things as big as this Bepesaurus that got to about 25 foot long and it's covered by shaggy feathers. It's basically one of these raptor-like animals with big claws on the hand that actually get secondarily became a plant eater. And the only two known in North America I had the good fortune to discover and describe. But these are Louis Ray's pictures. Uh, got to meet actually in Salt Lake to begin with, with uh, uh, Archaeoraptor, uh, which was of course a fake, but they brought in Xu Xing from China to accept the specimen back from China. It was found at a rock show. And I got to see him again in Beijing multiple times. He's probably named more dinosaurs than any other human being on earth now. And he's considerably younger than me. <laughs> But they just keep handing him stuff and he cranks them out. Uh, but here's the fossil. It was partially prepped at the time uh, for work, but here's some of the feathery filaments. And see those big claws on that close up? 
the front of the skull, those grooves in them. Uh, they are interpreted by some people as perhaps. And this interesting uh, pocket here, they think might be for venom glands. But here's some of the feathers associated with this skeleton. Uh, sign ornithosaurus. Yeah, that was number 10. So that was a while back uh, when they described this. And it's a dromaeosaur. Here's more specimens, uh, the sacral claws, smaller ones, uh, not greatly preserved. But then they found this one, number 11, Microraptor. Uh, and this is one of my favorite fossils. And I've, and I've seen at least 100 of these things now. Uh, but you see the tail, feathers. Here's a wing here. But they have wings on the hind legs as well. They did not flap their hind legs. Those were just stuck out, just kind of uh, helped them a little more flight service, but they were not using them for uh, muscular uh, motion in, in the flight mechanism. Uh, pretty amazing, but yeah, nice little sickle claws. Here's some other specimens. You see, they got pretty good size, crow to raven sized animal. Uh, this is some of the interpretations of how they flew. Uh, and they've done work with the, uh, uh, the structure of the keratin of the preserved feathers. And we figure these things are shiny black, almost like rackles, uh, completely black uh, animals, which is interesting. Uh, there are other taxa of microraptorines that have been found. Uh, yeah, this one is pretty big, you know, quite a bit bigger than the other turkey size. The Siloraptor, uh, but they just keep coming. Uh, this is the most recent, 2020. Uh, Pausies from uh, San Diego State Museum. Got to describe this, and once again, there's this little group of feathers. The end of the tail is there, and then the feathers just keep going off the tip. And there's the skull of that one. And the feathers are hard. The wings are hard to make out. Uh, some are better than others. Then this one was described in 2010, short-armed animal. There's a stiff velociraptorine-like tail with this guy, though. Microraptors don't have such a stiff tail. Shorter skull, uh, didn't preserve feathers, but it's clearly a dromaeosaur. But here's another animal. They gave it a different name. People like to name things, so you gotta be careful with some of this. And on this animal, so he's got short arms, but pretty well developed uh, wings on it. Tails, got a lot of feathers on it. And here's a reconstruction of this thing. And you see this sickle claw, and it's found in Mongolia from the early Cretaceous. I've been trying to figure out its exact age. The rocks are really poorly dated. Uh, so it's early Cretaceous. As said, uh, some of the Grand County stuff from Utah could be remains of dromaeosaurs in the world. And this is all they got of this animal. It's actually found in a gravel uh, bed in these early Cretaceous rocks. Part of the reason it's not so well uh, constrained age-wise. Here's another Mongolian animal from the upper Cretaceous. You know, pretty scrappy, but analyzing this, they consider this the most primitive of all the dromaeosaurs, period, even though it's latest Cretaceous. Uh, uh, they've got other Velociraptorine relatives in Asia that are real similar. Uh, Linhoraptor, 2010, Sagan Magnus, 2006. I've got a cast of this skull or a skull of Sagan, and I've got a Velociraptor skull, and you can tell them apart. Uh, this one, I'm a little more unsure if it's not, you know, really a Velociraptor. So is it one or two new taxa? But they're in the same group of things. They're definitely close. Uh, to each other. European animals, you know, I'm not 100% convinced that any of these skeletons are for sure dromaeosaurs uh, based on what they've got. Uh, it's like, yeah, those feet, yeah, not, they're pretty cruddy looking. Yeah, I got, I got a claw. They're the suspect in my mind, but they got teeth. They're, they're dromaeosaurs in Europe uh, and soon they'll find some material, They're ha they have to be there. They did find this animal uh, from uh, Romania, it was living on an island, and it's a double clawed uh, 
raptor of some sort. But more recent studies have suggested this thing actually might be some weird island uh, bird. Uh, so that's why I don't give it a number uh, on this. But I, I'm starting to see people starting to put it back in the dromaeosaurs. So I may have to readjust uh, a little bit. Uh, but it's a pretty nice fossil. And the double claw, hook claws are unquestionably there, the dew claw and the first, the second uh, claw on the foot. Uh, meanwhile, North America, number 12. I mean, there's just stuff happening all the time, these different places. Uh, Bambi Raptor. This was found in the Two Medicine Formation in Montana. Uh, a commercial dig for a while. I think the fossil uh, went to a private museum in Florida. Uh, Dave Burnham, who certainly has very serious commercial ties, even though he's now at the University of Kansas. Uh, I think the thing actually got bought when that museum in Florida went belly up. I think they spent a million dollars on this thing. Uh, and it's now at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, Atrociraptor, this is from the latest Cretaceous. This is a dromaeosaur that lived with T. rex. And all they've got on it are lower jaw and upper jaw, just the front of the mouth, that's it. Uh, and it's a, they think it's a dromaeosaurine, uh, but that's all they've got. You know, you got dromaeosaurus with the lower half of the skull, the foot, and then they've got this is just the front of the skull. Uh, that's definitely younger rocks. Uh, Nick Longridge, going through micro collections at the Royal Terrell Museum in Canada, uh, discovered material he was able to show belonged to a micro terrine, dromaeosaur. Those four winged animals have their own subfamily as well now, small animals, and they also occur in North America. But such small fragile fossils are rare. So this collection was a real nice thing for him to stumble into. And then of course, we found another dromaeosaur. This is from the lower fauna, Utah Raptor. Uh, Phil Center, I invited to come in and work on it. Um, you know, because basically I had therizinosaurs I was working on at the time. I only do so. I'm one of the authors, but I'm not the lead. Uh, but there's a skeleton all scattered out, lots of vertebra. There's Don DeBlue, the assistant state paleontologist of Utah, working on his find. He found this thing. It's part of a giant bone bed. Here's part of that vertebral column. And then here's a pelvis found about 20 feet away. And you can see that wide base, you know, short nischium. There's the pubis. But it's, you know, is it pulled back as much? Doesn't seem, seems to be actually a little more extended forward. But uh, that's probably is Yorgovucci as well, just comparing that ischium against that, they're really different. Uh, so where did, did Yorgovucci give rise to Utah Raptor? I'm guessing, but for phylogeneticists, there's no such thing as ancestor descendant relationships. Here's my strat column for the area. I got Yorgovucci, Utah Raptor. We have a new thing that's a Raptor that because it's in rocks are about 10 million years younger, we have a big break there at the base of that unit. Uh, we're calling it CF Utah Raptor, so similar to Utah Raptor. Hasn't been studied. Denver Museum's working on that. Uh, and then up here, after that extinction, we have Deinonychus. And when we look at the family tree of everything, Yorgovuchia comes out with Dromaeosaurus and Achillebatar that I don't think belongs there at all uh, as Dromaeosaurine. So, much more likely that it could have given rise to it. Uh, Sornithelestes solvani was named from New Mexico. It's a second species of Sornithelestes. And once again, all they had for this was a frontal, same bone they had two of when they named the first uh, Sornithelestes. Uh, and then up in uh, uh, Northern Canada, up in the Arctic, this, uh, and once again, it's another frontal. It, it's just, man, they're naming things. Recently, a Tyrannosaur was named in New Mexico on just one frontal. Uh, you know, I guess they're good bones, but it's, I like to have more. I think we're stirring up the literature uh, with these things. But that one, oh, they got a couple claws, uh, but you know, they might not even be associated from what I read. Eight and 30. 
uh true don today i didn't discuss these they're not they're the sister group to the dromaeosaurs uh dale russell speculated because of the large scale brain that these things have they were the potentially the brainiest dinosaurs that if dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct that were seriously anthropomorphic which shrink their tails down they didn't grow new fingers though you got to keep the three fingers <laughs> But uh, I didn't think they still have tails because it's so tied into locomotion. Makes no sense. But May Long is one that's very bird-like. And these guys actually may be a little closer to birds. Their tails are not stiffened like Velociraptorines. Uh, they're more like the, what I think now are Dromaeosaurines have the same kind of tail. There's a skull, Sarnithoides, Barnissers from Mongolia. There's a whole bunch of them. Their teeth are really distinctive because they have virtually no serrations and gigantic serrations on the posterior side, much, much bigger than in any of the dromaeosaurs. Uh, but they are somewhat related. The pelvis is a bit more primitive and that the pubis isn't as pulled back. Uh, but that may be an adaption of Velociraptorines. It has nothing to do with the origin of birds. Uh, this is a late middle Jurassic Truodont from China that was preserved with feathers. And they've looked at the uh, uh, structures of the keratin and they know it had a red crest, black spots on the wings. They're able to map the color pattern out on this thing. You can't tell blue and some things, but red, black, brown, uh, you know, you can do pretty well with these, uh, these structures uh, in the construction of the feathers. It's, not a color like paint, it's a color structurally, the way light interacts with the feathers. So here's a more up-to-date family tree for the dromaeosaurines. Here are the truodonts over here. There's quite a few of them. Um, but I, if I had done that, we'd be talking for another couple hours. Uh, here are the groups, dromaeosaurines, velociraptorines, microraptorinae, unilaginae. You know, they make up uh, the dromaeosaurs, shenag at the base. And this real basal one way off by itself. You know, birds are dinosaurs, never forget it. Uh, so basically, Utah raptor descended from four winged proto birds. Let's just go back to that. Notice four wings, wings. The bottom of the tree in all the groups, they have wings. You know, these things are secondarily flightless. Maybe not the best flyers initially in the world, but they're secondarily flightless. So there's a lot of reconstruction. Our raptor, always like the turkey, because we don't know what it looked like on the outside. Uh, but birds aren't dangerous. You know, cassowary is the most dangerous animal on, bird on earth. That claw, they can punch that right through into your heart and kill you. You know, this guy's trying to defend himself from being attacked by a cassowary. I don't think you'd want that to happen. And here's an eagle taking out a pronghorn. I had a friend of mine that actually witnessed a deer being taken out by a golden eagle. And it was a pretty horrific sight. Uh, but they are vicious animals. But after all of this, Utah raptor is still the biggest and the baddest of all the raptors. Uh, you know, Ostraraptor is nearly as big, but it's a wimp. I'm thinking it's a fishing animal. You know, I think all of those guys are, uh, you know, using their feet to help pin down fish. And of course, the babies would have been cute because every all babies are cute. But recently, they discovered what they called the Cosini. This is kind of a commercial dig. The fossils are in a little museum in Florida. And this is all they found. In fact, this is actually the pictures make them look better than they are because the, most of the ends of these bones are just worn off. But the only thing really convincing is a claw, but largely, this is a work of art. See what they got there? And then they got this uh, based on a couple of the limb bones. It might be a bit taller than Utah Raptor, but it's not as massive by any means. Uh, but if you look at that claw compared to Utah Raptor, they're so similar, it's scary. Uh, you know, and where was this hiding for 60 million years between them? I mean, it's 60 million years between those two. Uh, that's the entire age of mammals. Uh, and this thing, the, the ulna has quill knobs. So they're sure this guy had feathers. 
but some people are suggesting that it's an oviraptorid, which also have wings, but they have no teeth and a big cassowary like crest. And they think it might be a big ansus and the claw is actually one of the claws on the hand because they had pretty big claws on their hands. Maybe, I'm, you know, I'm not in that fight, but I am watching with interest. Uh, and then, this is starting to get ridiculous. They've got an aquatic basal dromaeosaur, uh, house caraptor, uh, and look at that head. Duck like animals. <laughs> and this is now in its own fam subfamily as well. I think they've got another type. But these things I think are aquatic filter feeding dromaeosaurs. Uh, just what? <laughs> Uh, it's hard, hard to deal with this. Kehong Jude, how you pronounce that one? That's been thought of as a dromaeosaur, like a microraptor by some. Other people think it's more of a bird. Look at that tail, the feathers on there. Uh, here's a reconstruction. They know from the, uh, the structure of the feathers that it was brightly colored, iridescent, uh, the neck area. Uh, Here's a more reconstruction, your recent reconstruction. And some people actually, you know, put these guys as, you know, descendant from birds. That the Opteryx is here. Main birds we have today are here. You know, there are those Oviraptors like Anzu over there. All these guys have wings. Uh, interesting uh, concept. The Chinese, Chinese are real big that Dromaeosaurs and Truodonts are actually in the group, you know, aviale of birds are just secondary flightless, so people don't want to put them there and they get big. Uh, the most recent animal described is actually from the San Juan Basin in New Mexico. Uh, uh, uh from Dene, uh, wash up there, you know, Dave and I walk around those beds, no doubt, and there's a reconstruction of this guy uh, there's Alamosaurus, sauropod that came back in maybe from Asia, walking along the Pacific Coast Highway and then snuck in around Vegas. Uh, they're only known in the South, but it's more closely related to Asian things. And, and this is Oho Ceratops, not Triceratops. Alamo formation. So these are late Cretaceous, uh, lived with. Uh, uh, but number 33, uh, so recent years have been uh, real good. There it is down there. Uh, raptorines, Dromaeosaurus, the basic pattern we've discussed a few times. Now to talk about the big find, Utah Raptors, Tut's tomb discovered in Utah. All the Utah Raptor sites, older rocks around Arches National Park. And why are these there? Well, as we've done research, and I'm not going into it all because that's another talk, uh, discovered that the yellow cap member, the lower part of the Cedar Mountain, the two, with two dinosaur faunas in it, only occurs in Grand County, Utah, and is related to salt tectonics. Salt was probably very buried under miles of sediment and squeezed to the south, causing a basin to form up in this northern area. Uh, the fold that caused arches is later, but they're probably a series of these folds trending in this direction and the salt going along them to the south and the substance leading to deposition of sediments that preserved a unique dinosaur fauna for Grand County, Utah. No, nowhere else in North America. <coughs> we don't just have the oldest Cretaceous dinosaurs in North America. We have the two earliest Cretaceous faunas in North America. I had a student working on the poison strip sand up here, and he just, you know, asked him to look for bone. He wasn't very good at finding bone. He said, there are a couple of things that look like human arm bones sticking out here about where they were. And walked around for half a day. That's Scott Madsen at the time. He was with Dinosaur National Monument. So looking for the bone. You see the rock is white. The bone's kind of white. You know, we were ready to give up, and we finally found where they were coming out near this big rock right in about there. Um, and the site uh, looked good because the first thing, you know, the next year really, uh, time out there, I took a rock just loose on the front, broke open, and here's the front of a jaw and a claw. 
in the first piece I really looked at from the site. Just, oh, this looks interesting. Since we are working the, there was dinosaur site, Valkyrie site over by Green River, Utah. And this was on state land. So the fossils really needed to stay in the state. I got Washington University, which was starting a dinosaur program in St. Louis and said, you know, do you guys want to work on something? There's theropodonts. That's a pelvic bone of an iguanodon right there. End of a big leg bone there. Uh, they said, sure, we'll get to the theropod in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, not even close. Uh, Karen Poole here wrote up the iguanodon and hopefully will write up more of the stuff from this site. Uh, but their program crashed and burned. She got her thesis out of it, but she then went to Stony Brook and is teaching at Michigan State, teaching anatomy. Uh, but we had a big rock fall in between, and you see all these rocks all over the site. There's jackets and uh, burlap, but rolling their jacket off, we left a lot of sandbags. So it wasn't as bad as it could be, but it was bad. Broken claws, all kinds of... You know, we had to clean it up. And as we were digging this thing, you know, got it all cleaned up. And at that point, we knew we had Utah Raptor in the site. But we had claws uh, of Utah Raptor and other things that we thought were diagnostic. And as we were digging, we realized we couldn't put a dental pick into this stuff without it coming across into bones. You know, we, you don't normally want to take collect things that big. You can possibly avoid it. You try to make them smaller. Do it. I mean, here's a big chunk here. That was in this area that we rolled off the top. It was a pod of muddy sand, sand mixed with sand. These are paleo soils. This is a floodplain soil sequence, but this is mostly sand. And coming block right in about there, we mapped a sandstone dike beating sand into this thing. So, you know, since it wasn't a river, didn't seem to be a pond or levee, it was like, you know, what is that blob an inch into the surrounding rock? Uh, you know, measuring the section, which I do a lot because I describe rocks as well. Uh, we got some dates on detrital zircons, 136 million, some very solid dates on these things. And as you see, these are blobs in this floodplain, red bed, mud, you know, floodplain environment. But down here's a lake sediment with beach gravels and the dikes had gravels in them going feeding into these things. So it's like, you know, that's it. And this lake system, you know, covered hundred square miles in that area uh, in the Northeast side of arches. So, you know, the, it was a pretty extensive lake system. Well, this is the Delta for Lake Powell at height, Utah. And lake levels were down. I was leading a field trip out there and I'm looking off of this, this cut. This is a, a, a view site. And I'm looking down and the river's like running below me. Uh, I can't even see the river proper. This is all the delta, you know, filling in the lake. And if you look at these things, this is a sand volcano. Water's coming up. You know, the weight of these sediments is the lake levels go down, compact. The water's got to go somewhere, can't compact. So it squirts up and brings sand with it. And you can see the sand coming down in there. And here's one that's collapsed. There's another one's collapsed, another one's collapsed. These are probably related to collapsing uh, water escape structures. You know, these are, you know, it's a sedimentary feature, water escape structure, no problem. What do we call these things? Quicksand. <laughs> And uh, basically, you don't sink in quicksand. There's a mire. This is a mud hole, but uh, not a mire, but you know, literally quicksand. This is sand mostly. Uh, basically, you get trapped in it. You can float. You know, keep your body above it. You're less dense than it is. You know, you're not going to die if you don't panic. But if you can't get out, you eventually will die. You'll starve to death. Uh, but when the hydraulic head, the water coming up, stops, the whole thing is in on itself. And if you go to Google Earth and look at the Delta area, you'll see hundreds of these depressions go through different years. And they're all in the same neighborhood of five meters to 10 meters in diameter. They're all about the same. Uh, and that's consistent with what we are seeing at this site, which I found real interesting. So knowing that even though I was pretty convinced that I had a you know quicksand site, 
I got to find someone that people would believe. So I got a hold of Ed Simpson. Hi, Ed. I hope it's like you're doing good. <laughs> He's here watching. And there's Ed with his student. And this is some of his structural interpretations of the collapse features around this blob. You know, this thing came up from below. You know, the sand beach stuff is not too much farther down here. A little bit of sand over here. This was up here. Blob was over here. It's about where her head is. I rolled off the collect that. Uh, but you can see the scale of this thing and the overall structure. But these are, you know, they're soil nodules. This is red mudstones. This is loaded with sand. Get to the edge, nothing. Uh, trying to get it off the hill. You know, we try to get a helicopter. Uh, they're all in the Middle East. Uh, you know, the Air National Guard was willing to help us, but they didn't have any copters that could lift it. Uh, in fact, after we did this, Columbia helicopter up in Washington that they were going to, we needed their help still. It's like, yep, you missed it. Uh, but we designed this guy, Phil Policelli, designed a set of skids. Cross Marine Salvage allowed us to use their shop to put it together. We measured everything out in the field uh, initially to make sure we're all right. You see these are big, you know, 12 by 12 beams, big, huge, two inch diameter threaded rods that go through the whole thing. You know, we built it for bear because we had watched the Terrell Museum uh, crater the Boreal Pelta block. And they're working on a coal mine with every possibly have. We had to build this road up to the site. Being state land, I could get permission uh, to do it, but we're half a mile from the, a national park. So this was, this is get, getting the politics done on this right was tricky. But there we are pulling it away. At this point, my head's actually was turned until this point, turned the other way. I couldn't even watch it when they started moving it. But when we put the frame on, it didn't move a millimeter till we started pulling it. You know, we built the frame right to the block took the rock away from it uh, so uh, it was in place and then drag it all the way down the hill and half a mile so we could load it onto a truck and drag it out we had some skids uh, these are guardrails uh, we didn't put them on right away even though we had the boots on the front and you can see we we're ripping those beams to shreds over the rocks so we took the track out tilted it up put them on and then continue dragging and it worked a lot better. Uh, there it was in the snow. And then the price of oil collapsed right as we did this. And we had no place to put the block. Too big to put in our lab. The museum uh, at the University of Utah, the floors aren't strong enough for it. So Thanksgiving point, the Museum of Ancient Life allowed us to use their lab. Um, and Cross Marine Projects helped us cover the move. They put a lot of money into it. Built a steel frame under the wood frame so they could put casters on, brought it in, and we worked on it in their lab for about five years. But that's you know, a 20 minute drive to their lab. And after five years, they decided they wanted to use their lab for something else. The museum director who finished repairing this beautiful space, which was a trash heap, until he decided to fix it for us, and we were able to fit the block in there. And this is only about a hundred yards from our main paleo lab. GoFundMe brought in uh, money that we could buy microscopes because it all needs to be prepped under microscopes. This is about less than 10. And you see a vertebral column, vertebral column, vertebral column, you know, legs, uh, jaw bones. If you go to GoFundMe uh, doc, uh, Utah Raptor site, you can link into some videos We've got a 3D model we created uh, uh, that you that we made a fly through of the model, and it, it's truly a beautiful thing to see. Uh, but the skeletons here are as dense as what we see for Coelophysis at Ghost Ranch. I mean, it is loaded. There are probably dozens of animals, and there's big animals. We have a big adult. We have juveniles that we think of as two-year-olds, about as big as Velociraptor. Babies that are a little bigger than a chicken. Uh, you know, maybe six months old, you know, but different hatchings, a couple intermediates that we don't have from yet. But they're probably less common. And basically, when these things would have a nest, they'd probably lay 30 eggs. 
You know, and if Young followed the adults, this is how I figure out these packs are structured. They follow the adults. Uh, the adults were making the kills, the little ones maybe panicking herds so they could get at something to kill. Uh, next year, another brood would join them. So you get these age segregated populations and the bones seem to support that kind of pattern. Uh, we've got a lot, years of data collection as we clean up this block, establish if that's really going on. But if you think 30 young a year, these things probably aren't even sexually mature till they're eight or 10 years old. You know, you end up with hundreds of babies, you know, before they're even sexually mature. Obviously out of a pack led by a male and female, only two surviving keeps you a balanced ecology. So these things are cannon fodder for the adults. In a good year, maybe two or three, four survive. Bad year, none. You know, that's the way nature works. Julius uh, Kosnove up in Alberta, you know, it's in his book on, uh, you know, the art, paleo art of Julius Kosnove. But go to the GoFund. There's a lot of links to videos of us dragging the block down, working on the block things that we can't show here. Uh, this is the moment by the Senate, waiting for the governor's signature, but it's gonna happen. 25 million bucks for Utah Park at Dalton Wells. This is the approximate configuration. So many sites just outside the park. I still want these in, but uh, I'll be happy to get Dalton Wells, one of the bigger sites in the, in the West. Uh, it's bigger than Dinosaur National Monument. So it'll be a good thing to do. Right by the major highway, there's Moab Airport. Tourist Central, you know, Arches is over here. Canyonlands is down here. You know, Six million people a year going here to learn about the desert Southwest. So we should be able to have success. We'll have a lot of camping back in here uh, that will set up to help pay for it. Uh, so basically, you know, Utah Raptor is gonna be one of the best known of these guys. Uh, eventually, I don't live to see all the information. Generations of young scientists will do theses on this. It's long after I'm dead and gone. My job at this point, since I'm in my late sixties, is to just ensure that those specimens fans possible. And we hope that block, after maybe ten years of work in Salt Lake, can be moved out of the state park as one of the exhibits uh, there. Uh, and that's my goal. And I think the governor is on our side relative to that. So anyway, thank you very much. If you have any questions or, you know, wake up, uh, everyone, you know, time to get up. <laughs> it's over. You're, you're safe now. All right. Yeah. All right. That was fun. So... <laughs> There's a lot of slides. <laughs> that was. Yeah, sorry. I just no way I could cut that down anymore. I've cut it a lot. No, that was fascinating. Uh, every year, a couple new ones. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, can you tell you a little more about these waves of extinctions where the, the American fauna were wiped out by? Yeah, uh, yeah, the early Cretaceous. Uh, yeah, I didn't give you the full dinosaurs of Utah uh, chart, which you can also link to from the GoFundMe site. Oops. Uh, yeah, I'll never get back there. Let me stop sharing for a second. Fill my whole screen. Uh, how do you do that? Escape. Hit the escape button, and stop. you'll you'll get back to where you can. Okay, at least I can control it a little bit. Yeah, what's going on with uh, you know Utah at this point? Well, yeah, actually, it's going beyond this point. But uh, what I've come up with in my chart of dinosaurs of Utah. We have now identified 27 non-overlapping dinosaur faunas uh, spanning the entire Mesozoic. And, and we have the fortuitous situation where, of course, the ancestral Rockies are in the Rockies and into New Mexico, you know, these fault block mountains shedding sediment to the west toward the Pacific across Utah. So we have this big, broad Triassic through Middle Jurassic floodplain. Uh, and basically... Uh, that gives us this record to the Jurassic. The Morrison is probably a hiatus interval. Sediments are covering the West from Canada down to central New Mexico. Uh, fairly similar thickness for the whole package. You know, there's really no foreland basin for the Morrison. 
Uh, but as you get into the Cretaceous, you know, we have this unconformity because basically it's, it's quiescence. And quiescence isn't good for deposition of uh, sediments. And we get this unconformity that we used to think was about 25 million years. Uh, we've got new dates in the Morrison. The top of the Morrison's about 150. Our oldest dates in the Cedar Mountain above it now in, in this area around Arches are maybe 142. So we might be shrinking that to about 8 million years. And as it turns out, most of that gap now is in the uppermost Jurassic. We have almost a complete Cretaceous record. Uh, which is exciting. And why we have that older stuff, the yellow cap, is all because of salt tectonics. You know, when we had the ancestral Rockies in front of the ancestral Uncompadre uplift, we developed the salt deposits, the paradox salt, 3,000 feet of salt. And salt never becomes real rock. It's always squishy. So you pile 1,000 feet of rock on top of 3,000 feet of salt, and it's going to move and squish. In places like the Gulf Coast, of course, you've got salt domes. In this region, you tend to get salt anticlines and synclines. Salt comes out of the area of the synclines and goes up into these anticlines. And arches is formed by a big salt anticline. That got breathed a river, sucking the salt out of it, so it collapsed in the middle. Uh, but the process of, of moving salt around gave us subsidence in the northern Paradox Basin around arches that preserved this yellow cat sequence. If you go to the west or the east, uh, a cobble conglomerate pavement, there's just this unconformity uh, that marks the beginning of deposition in front of the mountains. Going into this in detail, but we've now, because of the Cedar Mountain record, we've been able to stable isotope geochemistry on dinosaur teeth, on the paleosols, so we can tell you the first snowfalls uh, in the severe mountain range, the Thrust Belt Mountains, occurs probably near the base of the Albion because we can see in the teeth as they grow, uh, looking at oxygen isotopes, the, the light flush of snow melt from high elevation coming down annually through the area. Before that, it, it doesn't change. Uh, there's no evidence of any snow caps. So that Thrust Belt Mountain range by the and, you know, we, we get, you know, that's the first time we get snow. The first time we see a rain shadow is pretty much uh, at a, probably about the base of the Valentinian, about 135 million. Prior to that, it's a wet climate, but then we start getting a rain shadow. So the mountains are coming up, giving us a rain shadow from the west, uh, but no snow until the Albion. And then that's when we also start to see the classic Foreland Basin developed where the mountain range is lifting up from the thrust belt. Prior to that, there's no subsidence because uh, as some of you may be aware, I know Dave is, when you build a big mountain range up, because of the balance of mass, the, the whole surrounding area is gonna try to subside to get back in equilibrium. And that pulls down the surrounding area as well. So in front of a big mountain range, like the severe thrust belt, which was going obviously miles high at that time, you've developed this big area of subsidence up with this big asymmetric Cretaceous basin that extends from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but that whole process really didn't begin to about the middle of the early Cretaceous. Uh, and we were lucky enough to catch stuff before that so we can actually track it. And in geology, they teach you this is simultaneous. You lift the mountains and you get the subsidence, simultaneous geologically. We now can, with dates, radiometric dates, tell you the delay is 20 million years between evidence for a four-limb basin and evidence for a rain shadow. Pretty neat. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, as I say, sexy geology. <laughs> And Ed Simpson is working with us on, you know, we got a bunch of people that, you know, are jumping on this bandwagon, uh, doing things with geochemistry and whatnot, things that I can't do. You know, I'm, I'm kind of an old school kind of geologist, paleontologist <laughs> that, that knows how to beg people, you know, always talk that I'm, I'm pimping research all the time. <laughs> but that's my job, you know, Utah's cheerleader.
There you go. Jim, uh, Austin had a question about sure. eggs. He says, uh, eggs, eggs, did you find any eggs? We actually might have a partial Utah Raptor nest uh, across the, the highway from Dalton Wells, but same level. You know, we're talking less than a mile, you know, three quarters of a mile. Uh, four eggs were found there, you know, and the breast is probably down the hill by you. No one's ever written it up. It's not mine. But, uh, you know, there's some, there's some eggs that might be Utah Raptor eggs. We have stuff on the poison store. We have eggs at almost every level in Utah. Uh, the oldest eggs, though, uh, are in the Morrison. We don't have any Chinle Triassic eggs at all that I know of. Uh, and I don't think we have any in the country, which is weird because those most of those animals laid eggs. So you should see them. <laughs> but we don't. But we get eggs. Once you're in the Morrison, every formation we have eggs all the way to the, to the Mastrictian. In fact, the last dinosaur eggs in the North Horn are probably your best indicator, last eggshell fragments of the end of the Cretaceous. Oh, and there's some good nests. They found uh, big eggs. I used to think these were Tyrannosaur eggs when they were finding them in China uh, that were identified as Mega Elongulithus. These are foot and a half long cylindrical eggs, like oviraptor eggs, but bigger. And uh, as it turns out, they go to Gigantoraptor, which is a 30 foot long oviraptor in China. Uh, well, eggs of that type are found at the top of the Cedar Mountain formation. Uh, you know, clearly they're identified recently as these are Mego elongulithus. And it was suggested by Greg Paul, well, eventually you guys are gonna find some giant oviraptors. Well, the Field Museum has found giant oviraptors associated with those, those eggshell fragments. And North Carolina Museum of Natural History now has two pretty intact nests of these things. And they're big. I mean, we're talking, you know, bigger than football size eggs, you know, in, in rings. And they laid them in pairs. Both oviducts were functioning. Uh, but, you know, they find the eggshell and then predict you're going to find the dinosaur. Sure enough, <laughs> they found it. Great. Uh, science works really nice, you know, I, I, I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> yes, sir. I had an uh, observation. Uh, yeah. Why Velociraptor was used in the movie instead of the, the real name? I think it's, at least it should be considered that it it was probably chosen because in the the name, two the roots of two uh, familiar English words are words used in English anyway. Velocity for you know speed and raptor for raptor. Oh yeah, well uh, you know Michael Crichton, you know uh, Greg Paul's book uh, yeah. by the New York Academy of Sciences, Predatory Dinosaurs in North America. It came out a couple of years before he wrote the book, around the same time. And Michael Crichton got very enamored with that book. And that's where, you know, Greg synonymized him. He definitely based it on because He said as much, you know, these animals are dynamic, you know, anteropus. Uh, but he believed Greg, no one else did, but he's a writer and a paleontologist. So he, you know, decided that was the last, and that was the biggest raptor on the planet before we found Utah Raptor. Kind of a wolf sized thing. You can think of Utah raptors more of a bear sized animal, uh, considerably bigger. But, uh, you know, Michael Crichton, you know, he, you know, he was doing research, you know, he, his heart was in it, but he got led down the rosy path, which happens too often. You know, people come out with a real hot theory and sometimes it crashes. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Sylvia uh, Ramos Cruz had a question. Uh, she's not sure what you were saying about dinosauroid. And, and can you explain? Oh, the dinosauroid. Yeah, Dale Russell uh, came up with this thing oh, back in the, oh, probably in the 70s. He did this, this book, uh, Dinosaurs of Western Canada. Dale was one of the, you know, the, was one of the leading people on tyrannosaurs and druidons and ornithomimids, you know, real expert with the Canadian stuff. 
And looking at Truadon, and I've got a cast of that skull roof, you know, here in my office. I can't grab it that quick, but it's got a big brain. It's got a brain about as big as a cat. And, the, you know, the animal's skulls are like that long. I mean, it's got its large brain. And if they were like birds with, uh, you know, very finely developed neurons, so, you know, neuron packing is two to three times what those things could have been reasonably smart too, but not true at on that smart. Uh, you know, so true, neuron packing, I really want to see what comes out of that once they look at crocs. Do they have it yet? Because uh, it changes everything relative to dinosaur intelligence. Uh, but because of that, he figured if dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct, uh, they would have, you know, he, he's, he's a very good Catholic. So, of course, he had to make his animals anthropomorphic, you know, because in his mind, you know, that would be God's image. So, <laughs> so he had him lose the tail, <laughs> shrink the mouth, lose the sharp, developing like its size. But he turned them into people, you know, gave, kept the three, the three, toe, three fingers. So they had a three fingered hand, but very opposable thumb on that hand on those guys. You know, I, I just tell people, you know, if dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct, they probably, the first moon landing would have maybe been in the Oligocene. You know, I mean, because the only reason we're here is that asteroid. You know, they were doing plenty good at the end. Uh, you know, we just have this tiny record in northern western interior. And as we find other records, you know, around the world and near the boundary, you know, just there, there's no statistical evidence that they were losing uh, diversity or abundance at the end you know there's just so many people that just you know just want it to be so you know gradualism want it to be so. uh, but uh, life is real interesting and now we know dinosaurs evolved as fast as mammals anywhere where we have a decent temporal record with dense dinosaur records like dinosaur provincial park san juan basin uh, Kaparowitz, you know lots of paleomag and radiometric dates we know the dinosaur species, none of them last more than half a million years. You know, where there's features like ceratopsians or adrosaurs that allow you to differentiate species. You know, some animals are tougher to, to you know, split. You know, if we were trying to split frogs on their skeletons, we'd really be up a creek because their skeletons don't vary nearly as much as other behaviors, such as the way they sing and whatnot, which are very much you know, features that separate the breeding populations uh, evolutionarily. But dinosaurs, you know, these big rhino-sized animals turning over every half million years. You know, when I started, I did a uh, half a million dollar exhibit on ceratopsians about 25 years ago. And now we have at least three, maybe four times as many known taxa. Uh, and at the time, I was really proud because I had skulls of every single known ceratopsian from around the world in that exhibit. I really figured I accomplished stuff, but uh, man, I've discovered so many new things. Uh, and as I said, I've got 27 overlap, you know, non-overlapping faunas. Most of them are split by little unconformities, little soil horizons, and things that may represent 100,000 years or so. So there's some good time gaps splitting my faunas. So I don't see a lot of evidence of evolution, but if you go down Grand Staircase, you know, what I was initially lumping, like the Wawi formation is one fauna, Kaparowitz is one fauna. Now the Denver Museum working in the, down there thinks there's three superimposed faunas in the Wawi and at least three, maybe four in the Kaparowitz. And that's a mile and a half of sediment. You know, that's the sediments coming in real fast there. Cedar Mountain, we have 45 million years and six faunas in about 250 feet of sediment. Uh, you know, not much sediment, but gaps between them. And fortunately, there's fossils everywhere. And any day I could find a site you could spend the rest of your career on. I mean, that's, it's that rich, you know, and no one even knew the rocks, you know, really. Uh, they weren't even teaching, you know, there's Morrison and then Dakota. <laughs> and a lot of things have been figured out since then. Uh, it's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, anybody uh, have any more questions for Jim? That was a, a marvelous talk. All righty. Well, that was uh, wonderful. Uh, I guess we'll let you go. But uh, we're going to, um, we have recorded this. 
Uh, so I'll put it up in a, in a few days, probably by the weekend, uh, on YouTube. And I'll uh, send you the link. Oh, and you can send it to your friends. But we had uh, more interest in, in this talk than uh, most any other. I was getting inquiries from uh, all over. So, um, yeah, great, People, great topic. Like dinosaurs, space science, and dinosaur paleo, the two gateways. One for natural history, yep. one for technology. Di yeah, dinosaurs. Really That's what get our, we, that's what we capture them kids. Dinosaurs <laughs> are a, a gateway <laughs> drug to geology. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, I'm going to watch these heathens. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Jim. All right. And, happy uh, to do it. <laughs> we'll uh, uh, send out that link when it, when it comes out. Yeah, yeah, give me the link because I definitely like to. I probably be very embarrassed when I listen to it. <laughs> no, no, you did great. All righty then. I'm through. Okay, I see applause in the audience. There we go. Uh, thanks, Jim, and uh, we'll we'll catch you later. I will do that. All right, take care, everybody. Stay safe out there and get get your shots. Our, our puzzle of the month is uh, all about vaccine shots, so give that a. Look in our NMSR newsletter. Take care. Enjoy.